And you can sign up for the next seminar <laughs> by going to BullingtonCapital.com. That's coming up uh, pretty quickly. And uh, hang on a second. I got to just running a little bit behind here today. Sorry about that. So I got a seminar coming up. Uh, it's going to be on March 8th. That's coming up relatively soon. And we're going to be talking about estimating the impact of a financial crisis on your investments. Uh, we're going to show you some software that will allow you to take a look at what you're doing and kind of estimate the kind of risk you're taking. And it's one of the first packages, software packages, to be able to do this. And I didn't have it at the uh, last seminar, by the way. The uh, In fact, I'm always shown people and, and I've had to do it on a much more manual basis in the past, but now, uh, it's available, uh, through a, a software subscription. Uh, it's a little bit expensive if you're an individual, but it's one of the reasons I have a job and uh, we can pop your portfolio in there and we can tell you how much risk you're taking. And then we can kind of do a stress test and show you what it would have done during the financial crisis which becomes very important because one of the things that's really important to somebody that's either at or near retirement age, or actually of any age for that matter, when you're uh, adding to your assets, when you're trying to accumulate enough for retirement, uh, oftentimes people are taking way too much risk and they get lulled into a sense of security when the market's been doing well for three or four years. And then when the market has a big correction, now, a lot of them end up pulling and never getting back in. That's not a good idea. That's not a good plan. A better plan would be to, to find out approximately how much risk you're taking and then build your portfolio around your uh, ability to handle risk. And this particular package that we're talking about allows us to go at it from uh, one of two directions. Uh, the first direction is just you pick the... Uh, between a series of, I would risk this much money to make this much money. And that's a, uh, that's interesting. I like that philosophy a little bit. I'm going to risk, let's say I had, uh, let's say I had $500,000. Okay. I would be willing to risk um, losing 100000 to make 150000 Would you be willing to do that? And it'll tell you, it'll give you several questions like that and basically hone in on the type of risk taker that you are. And then it'll show you a portfolio and then it'll show you how the portfolio would have performed. Okay, so that's one way. One of the other things that it'll do is you can say, okay, um, this is the return that I would like to shoot for. And then it'll, it'll show you portfolios, assuming that uh, you're not shooting for 20% a year with you know, no downside. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, it'll show you portfolios that would match basically what your uh, your return goals are and then show you how much risk that takes. So it's really cool. I think I'm very happy. This is something that uh, I would have developed myself had I had a couple million bucks laying around that I didn't need. <laughs> and uh, I've done it on in different fashions. Uh I've got a spreadsheet out there that would show you the peak to trough decline uh, and uh, pulled all that data together. I've got a lot of resources, but I will tell you that most of them, uh, this, this is a better job. It really is. They spent a few million dollars in a few years developing this software. This is the software that I would have dealt myself had I had the time and the money because it is expensive to do stuff like that. But uh, I mean, incredibly expensive. Anyway, I'm going to uh, take a phone call right now. And by the way, if you'd like to call us, 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. And I'm going to go right to Richard. Richard, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, I have called before. Um, I'm going to want to make a case with you to buy um, 100% stocks all the time. Well, if because you've got enough know. money and you've got the right. risk tolerance, sure, absolutely. But if you don't, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, because we know it's it's returned. Well, what would we say, six to eight percent over 120 years per year average. But, but here's the thing: you're not looking at Richard, and I, I know we've had this conversation before. Somebody that's yes. taking money out of their account. Let's say you're taking five percent a year out. Okay, you're 100. No, no, I don't take it. No, no, I wouldn't take out five percent. I take out 
actually on a total return basis, um, 3%. Okay. So let's take, say you're taking out 3% and you're doing this in March of 2000. You've got a uh, million dollars. You're taking out 3%. You've got a hundred percent stock. You're down 57% from peak to trough right. over the next two years. So you're, well, you're right. taking out 30000 right. So over a three-year time period, you've taken out $100,000, and the account value is now, it's around, right around 400000 You will never get back to a million dollars. Oh, well, no, I think, you, I think you would. But, but anyway, uh, I... Um, how much would you like to bet on that? 100% <laughs> stocks through this entire uh, um, bull market. And an account that I have compared to, yeah. But see, uh, you're looking at you're account. looking at stocks, and and you're not taking into account, Richard. You have a much higher risk tolerance than other people do. You do, well, no, of course I do. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. If I, if, if now, other people, if and... if other people try to do what you're doing, they're going to be losing sleep at night, losing hair, having stress in, induced uh, heart palpitations. They just can't do it. And right, if you, if, right. Well, I, I guess the, the basic thing is I have enough money to yes. do this. And anytime you add bonds, you recharge that return that I talked about. Yes, you do. Anytime you do it. Yep. Uh, and so uh, if if everything collapsed, then I just have to reduce my lifestyle. Now, most people don't want to do that, but I'm willing <laughs> yeah. to do that. Here And here's something you might want to think about, Richard. Let's say you uh, stock market goes down 50% again, okay, but you're only down 25 by the time the stock market recovers, goes back to zero, five or six years later, you're up 12% because you had you didn't go down as much when the market dropped, especially if you rebalance yeah, well, your portfolio. Well, anyway, so, yeah, I, I survived fine because we've done this for years. and I believe Yeah, if you have enough money, period. yeah, there, there's no doubt about it. If you've got like big money and you can get by on a 1.7% uh, dividend that the uh, s and P's thrown off. The, uh, and I would tell you that a really easy strategy if, if that bounces back quicker and has had longer returns in the long run is once a year you go in and you throw out every stock from the S&P 500 that hasn't paid a dividend that year, and you keep all the others that do, and you equally weight them. You should look and see what the returns on that are. The, uh, they're yeah. significantly higher and they have a significantly lower um, volatility level. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying big time. And I, and I agree uh, with, with most of it, but I just you have to remember most people are not rich. Only one in five households has $100,000 and more than 50% of them are above the age of 50 or 60 rather. So, well, right, I understand that, but um, I, I still think they would be better off too because of that return over the long period. But well, without it, knowing it, their financial situation and without knowing anything about them, that's really hard to say. I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's impossible to say. I'm being kind. The uh, when you don't know anything about somebody's background or their financial situation to make a recommendation like that, they would take my license away for that. I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> they would. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you could easily make uh, an argument that that's the no, best it, way it, for it, them it, to It's not a market. You know? <laughs> yeah. And different strokes, different folks, but they we are governed. I I'm a fiduciary. Um I am not allowed to do right. that. And uh, believe me. You're not yeah. allowed to. Well, I don't know. Then then I well, I, I guess Not without knowing more about somebody. People, but it's hurting everybody. It's hurting everybody though who can't do that then. Yeah. Know? And most people just don't have the uh, the stomach to have a hundred percent stock portfolio. I can tell you from the last thirty years I've been doing this, the vast majority yes. of people don't have the stomach for an all stock portfolio. I have oh, right. No, I know that. I know that. Yeah, I have twenty percent of my money in short term bonds, and you know it, I don't like it, but I understand the next correction that comes around, I will take some of that money and buy those stocks. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they go well, up a lot, know, that, that, now that is a good idea because uh, the market does crash every now and then. Oh, yeah, and yep. that is an outstanding time to buy. That's yep. why you shouldn't be in yep. there buying. You know, every time so I get a have some cash for that. When I get a a, a decline that's more than fifteen percent, the uh, I'm uh, I'm buying. I'm I'm typically not selling. So that, but that's I ha I have that planned out ahead of time because I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when. 
So I just keep right. the money. Would you say that? Would you say that now would be a good time to sell a few stocks and build a cash thing so that because the stock the market's at an all time. That doesn't I, that doesn't know, matter. Actually, time. if you take out the top 50 stocks out of the S&P 500, the valuations on the rest of the stocks are extremely good. So, But if you take out Google right. and you take out Amazon uh, and you take out yeah. you know some of the really big, high-flying names, Facebook, their valuations are really high and they make up a large percent of the S&P 500. That's why I wouldn't be a big investor in the S&P 500 right now because it's overweighted with the stocks that are the most overvalued. So I would right. say this is a good time to go in and look at your portfolio and start to shift that money around away from those areas. Because you're going to get hurt there more. Now, they've gone up more than anything else has in the last four or five years. So that makes it very right. difficult for an awful lot of people to say, yeah, I think it's time to move this into some other areas that might have more opportunity. Right, right. But that's really hard to do. That That's actually harder than, than putting 100% of your money in stocks. <laughs> Well, well, for one thing, if you sell those tech stocks that are high, that are very expensive, right. um, uh, you will get a huge capital gain and taxes you have to pay. <laughs> yeah, but I'd rather so. pay taxes on money I have than not pay taxes on money that I lost. <laughs> right, 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 right. But yep, I'm yeah, I'm telling you, well, don't let the you. tax well dog that wag the dog. That is a bad idea. The uh, you go and you yeah, look. But anyway, I don't, I don't think uh, my idea though of selling some now to get a cash reserve so that when it if it does go down precipitously as it did a little while ago actually. Well, yeah, everybody's um, going to be a little bit different on that. The low, but of yeah. course you can't pick the low. You can't pick the low. No. And you can't pick the high. But... Really, you can't. So I always carry cash, just in case. But I remember Warren Buffett in his book. Uh, in in uh, eighty seven, when the market crashed, all him and all his friends were running out to the phone immediately to try to buy stuff. You know. <laughs> oh sure. Well, they had money in cash. Don't 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 be fooled. Right. He was never one hundred percent invested in stock. He couldn't be, uh, and he had the revenue from all those insurance companies. You know, back in eighty seven, sixty percent of his profit came from in his insurance operations, and the insurance yeah. insurance is a lot more predictable than a lot of people think it is. It's always providing cash flow. So he had this money coming. He used to call it the float. He would always take his float yeah, and go yeah. out. You know, that's actually when he bought Coca-Cola. His, his, he's the single largest shareholder in Coca-Cola. So, yeah. He yeah. is the largest shareholder? Yep. yep. Has been How for a long time. How has that done for him? Has it done well for him? Well, it did really well all the way up until about 1998. And then it's actually, it's gone down and it's not too much higher than it was uh, since 1998. So you're taking like 20 years with a, you know, not much of a return yeah. at all. But here's the thing at his cost basis, it's about 10% of what the, I think it's right around 10% of what the, the price is selling for now. Cause he did buy it right after the crash in 1987. And oh. so his dividend is huge based on his initial investment. It's not huge right. based, based on the current value. It's not huge. But it is huge you based on value, right? Right. So that I'm sure that's why he doesn't sell it, and uh, one one of the reasons, right. you know, other, right. other than right. the fact that he, you know, he likes cherry coke. But <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, the other thing about the stock market, which I I don't know if I've heard you talk about, but what you should talk about is uh, when if when the market does crash, there's most of the gains coming back are only on a few days. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Do you know what that means? So, so therefore, if you aren't in the market at that time because yeah. you panicked, yep. you know, you right. won't you won't get the stuff back. You won't even come close to getting stuff back. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's why you've always got to be in it. You always have to be yeah. in it, at least with some portion of your money. I got to take another phone call before we go to commercial okay. break. But thanks for calling. Thank I appreciate you. it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, and I got Chuck. Chuck, we've got a couple minutes before commercial break. How you doing? Good. I'll be real quick. Um, so um, I, I had picked up a, a, a silver, I'm sorry, not a silver, steel ETF right before Donald Trump got elected based on the whole building up the infrastructure, rebuilding our military, especially our Navy. Um, I, I'm up on it uh, about 25 percent um, plus the dividend. Cool. But now with all this and I was watching the steel stocks just the last couple of days and it's like, what do you think the 
like is what's going to happen in regard to these tariffs, how that's going to affect these steel stocks? Uh, it, it's really too early to tell because you don't know if the tariffs are actually going to be put in place or not. And, okay. You know, they, right now they're just talking about it, and which is oftentimes the threat is enough. You don't actually have to follow through with it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's no secret that Chinese uh, government, a lot of governments around the world, not just the Chinese, but uh, will dump steel. They've been dumping steel forever on the United right. States. And we've been supporting them. And through our currency policies, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, they've been taking advantage of it. And quite frankly, in Northeast Ohio, you know, it's, it's done a world of hurt around here. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I, so I, now if the tariffs actually go through, would you think that would be beneficial for steel stocks or sure, sure. negative I mean, for steel I mean, stocks? Right. Well, let's say you're making a product and you've got a, compete, a competitor who makes an identical product and suddenly the price of buying his product goes up. Mm-hmm. You think you would benefit? Yes. Yep. That's exactly how it works. Okay. So, so it, uh, it could be beneficial then. then well, yeah. But if it goes up too much and the price of a new car goes up by three or four thousand dollars and people start to notice they might you know put off buying the new car and buy the used car so, right and that's i can remember like in the mid 2000s when commodity prices were flying up and i remember right. i was having a fence built and it was actually cheaper to get a nice wooden fence than a chain link fence <laughs> yeah because of the commodity prices yeah yeah it, it has all kinds of uh every one of those moves has an enormous number of side effects and right. the side effects are not always predictable either. Um, it's, you never know. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. When uh, Isaac Newton said every action creates an equal and opposite reaction, uh, he had no idea how smart he was. Because <laughs> right. there are collectively, there are tons of actions that go on. Um, I hear the music. That means I got to take a quick commercial call. Thanks for calling today. And uh, everybody else, this is Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer. Stay tuned because I'll be right back. back. Hey, if you'd like to call 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. And I will remind you again, we've got a uh, workshop coming up. I think this is going to be one of the uh, better ones that we've done in quite a while. Estimating the impact of a financial crisis on your investments. You know, in today's market, you have to take some risk if you want to make much more than two or 3%. It's just uh, the way it is. Uh, and uh, I've heard I was down in Florida a couple days this past week, and I heard an ad there, and I was just thinking, holy cow, I can't believe people are actually advertising that you can earn stock market returns with no risk. It just, it's just not possible. Not in this environment. Not yet. And you do have to be careful about fixed income. I think interest rates probably, I think short-term rates probably peak out around 3% or so, uh, which is pretty high. By the way, a 3% short-term interest rate when you were less than 1%, that means you're going to have an overall plus 2% increase at some point in time. It's not quite there yet. It's close, very close. So if you have uh, short-term interest rates at 3%, your treasury is probably going to be somewhere around 45 The uh, uh, 10-year, you're probably looking at three and three quarters, maybe. Yeah, close to that somewhere between three and three quarters and four. And the 3% short-term interest rates that come due on all these treasuries that are floating around, uh, that would be an enormous increase in the amount of money that the government has to pay on the interest expense. So remember, when they set those, when they raise those rates, they have to pay them too. And I just can't, uh, I don't know. I shouldn't say I can't imagine because I didn't, you know, a lot of things have happened that I, didn't think what happened over the past few years, but the uh, uh, reality of the situation is that would be kind of inflationary. Um, the Fed would have to uh, really start printing money in, in overdrive, which they have been doing anyway. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, it's a good thing stocks are not super overpriced. In fact, like I was telling the gentleman earlier, if you took out 
the big glamour stocks, the, uh, the Facebooks, the you know, Googles of the world, the valuation on the average stock drops fairly significantly. And it's been very interesting how that's been, uh, um, I don't know, I don't want to say sequestered, but, uh, you know, the larger companies have really been the recipients of most of the money, which is kind of common, particularly when you've got market cap weighted indexes, not just here, but around the world now. Most of the funds that have been created over the past couple of years are market cap weighted. That's posing some risk, some risk that people aren't aware of. They think that, uh, you know, they missed the boat because it didn't go up as much as Google or Facebook or Apple. I'm telling you, the, uh, a lot of those stocks, they're not going to hold on to those valuations forever. They won't. At some point in time, the pendulum swings the other way and they're not going to warn you. It's not going to tell you. You just have to be smart about what you're doing. And uh, here's something that you might want to think about. So let's say you're trying to be careful as an investor. You're keeping an eye, an eye on risk, how much risk you're taking. You actually know how much risk you're taking, which is one of the things that we're going to be talking about at that upcoming seminar. By the way, that seminar date is Thursday, March 8th. It's at 630 uh, at Tricy's Corporate College. Go to BullingtonCapital.com to sign up online. It's free. We'll take a uh, refreshment break. The uh, I think this is a very good time to be doing this. I identifying the kind of risk you're taking, trying to get your portfolio synced up, trying to avoid those areas in the market that are the most overvalued because the most overvalued tend to drop the, the farthest and they take longer to recover. So this is a key time to be looking at estimating the impact of a financial crisis because in a financial crisis, those stocks that are the most overvalued tend to drop the farthest and take the longest time recover. Now, there are some other ways, there's some indexes out there that you can invest in that haven't participated quite as much. Over the past three or four years, you might be upset over that. Don't be upset. Yeah, their day's coming. Yeah, identifying it now, adjusting your portfolio, it'll put you in a position to try to catch that. It can put you in a position to try and capture that when uh, they start to catch up. So has it been frustrating for you? Sure. But, but don't worry about it. Actually, having a, a safer portfolio is better than having one that, that skyrockets when the market goes up. And let me tell you why. Because when the market goes up, it takes a long time. Well, it crashes very quickly and it takes a long time to recover. And think about this for a second. Let's say you've got two portfolios, portfolio A, portfolio B. Portfolio A drops 50% like the S&P 500 did from November 2007 to March of 2009. Actually, it was more than 50%, but I'm going to run it off there. Give you the benefit of the doubt. Say so Portfolio B only dropped half as much because it was a balanced account. Had 50% in short-term fixed income. Only went down half as much. So it's only down there. That feels really good, right? So when the S&P doubles to get back to break even, which is what it has to do. It's got to literally double. It's got to go up 100% to get back to break even. If the portfolio that only went down half as much only goes up half as much, it only goes up 50% when the s and is up 100, okay? which would make everybody that's invested in that very angry. It, it has. It's actually aggravated an enormous number of people who don't know what I'm about to tell you. So if you were conservative going in and then you stayed conservative during the recovery process, you only made half as much money on the, during the recovery, but you only lost half as much when it went down. Do you know you're actually ahead by the time the people that invested in the stock market 100% got back to break even, you're ahead. You're ahead of the game. So in the long run, you end up winning. So and that's the key. You've got, to fo- you've got to focus on the long run. Always have some money in short-term cash, short-term ETFs. You buy treasuries. Those are exchange-traded funds, by the way. Have some money there. Have some money in some other fixed income, maybe some mortgage-backed securities. They go down. They just go, don't go down like stocks do. They go down very little, actually, a couple percent or so. In a 
crisis situation, it might be down 10 or 12%, maybe 15, depending on what you buy. I mean, it could be down 40 if you bought all the high yield bonds. You wouldn't want to do that. So again, um, but back to my example, let me finish this thought before I move on to something else. I'm, I'm constantly doing that, by the way, and I apologize for that. Yeah. So you have a portfolio. It's only down half as much. And then by the time the stock market recovers, you actually have a profit. It's about 12 and a half percent. So think about that for a second. Yeah. I got a million dollars. It goes down to $500,000 because it was hundred percent in stock. My million dollars that was 50% in short-term fixed income, short-term bonds, short-term CDs, whatever you want to use. It's only down 25% because it was only 50% exposed. Now, stock market recovery goes up 100%. Your portfolio only goes up half as much, 50%. What's 50% of 75? See, they went from a uh, uh, million dollars down to 500,000. Or let's make the math easier. 100,000 down to 50,000. They've got to go from 50 to 100. That's 100%. 100,000 down to down 25% is only 25,000. That's only, that's 75,000. If it's a million, it's 750,000. You started a million, you're only down 700, you're down to 750,000. A lot of people at a million dollars, they go down to 750,000. Oh, wait, wait, wait. And that's why you don't put hundred percent of your money in, <laughs> in stocks. If you don't know that, because you could be down 500,000. Yeah. Anyway. So at 750,000 and I have, if I only go up 50%, when the stock market went up a hundred percent, 50% of 75,000, $37,500. At thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars at seventy-five thousand, you got one hundred twelve thousand five hundred bucks. You're up. You're up twelve and a half percent by the time the other people are getting back to break even. Now, if you want that, you want to hear that again. Go to iTunes and, and <laughs> or go to nine five five thefish dot com. This this radio show is set uh, is set up there as a podcast, so you can go through that example over and over and over again. So, and this is one of the things that, uh, you know, we talk about a lot, but when the market's going up, it's probably going to beat just about everything, but, and that's good. And it's good that you have some money in there, but you don't have to have all your money in there because when it goes down, it drops fast. Stocks go down fast and you have to get used to that. It's, it's tough. What's really tough is today you have to be really used to that. I mean, because the interest rates are still pretty low. And when interest rates are low, by the way, when interest rates are low, you have to buy bonds typically that have less than five years to their uh, average maturity. And even those will move a little bit. They won't move a lot. I mean, they'll go down a little bit when if the market goes down. Some of them more than others. But you've got to stay away from certain other types of bonds because they're just they're going to go down a lot. In fact, they are going down a lot. Let me take a peek here. I didn't even look at this before the show. TLT is a long-term treasury ETF. And it's actively managed, by the way. And I remember actually a guy calling in here. Uh, it was in 2016. And he was very proud that he had said that he made a purchase that year. And, and it did well that year. It was up. 2016, it was up quite a bit. Actually, about 16%. It's actually now below where it was in 2016. Well, my calendar said 2018 last time I looked at it. So now two years later, and by the way, I could tell by the way that the guy was talking that he, he's not selling it. You know, he just thought it was a, a good idea. It had a higher yield than CDs did. Yeah, because the bonds have more than 20 years before they mature, the longer you're willing to hold on to something. But see that the fund managers don't have a lot to say about that. And right now, actually, it's right now below the price that it was in 2014. It's below the price it was in 2014. Now, you'd been very happy to get a 3% yield over that time period, right? 3%, but you lost part of your principal. You also saw it go up 15% twice, 15% or more twice, and turn around and give that back. And now it's, it's back significantly below where it peaked out in 2016. It's, it's down about 17% from there. So you can't buy bond funds without knowing what's in them because a lot of them have a lot of risk. You got to be careful with that. Uh, again, it's, this goes back to managing risk. You got to manage the risk. If you manage the risk, 
you should be able to reach reasonable goals. What are reasonable goals? I don't know, a 4 to 5% withdrawal rate. That's a reasonable goal. And evidently the uh, a guy calling in here earlier doesn't even need to take that much money out. So that's great. It means he's uh, loaded. Yeah, or he's got a really big pension. Either one. That's awesome. I'm glad. The, uh, a lot of people aren't in that, that category. So you have to be much more careful than that. You're going to have to take some risk. But you really need to manage that risk. And that's really what the seminar is all about. How do you manage risk? What are your best tools for managing your risk to reduce the, the chances that you'll go down so much that you'll panic and sell and then not move back into the market? That's what we really want to avoid. It, it's what average investors do. They get so caught up in markets when they're rising that they end up putting more money into the stock market when it's going up. And then when it, it comes down a lot, they tend to sell it uh, and, or take some money off the table, and then they miss the big moves back up again. And you don't really, first of all, you don't need to try to do that. that that's not necessary. That is not necessary. And you may have a question. You may be looking at your portfolio going, you know, I wonder how much risk I'm actually taking. Well, I've got this really cool tool now. <laughs> and we can model your portfolios the vast majority of them, even if you have individual stocks, you can model portfolios and show what kind of risk you're taking. And I'm going to be the first to admit, if you're going to do this with individual stocks and you've got fewer than 20 stocks, uh, it's not going to give you really good answers. But if you're an average person that has a combination of, of mutual funds, individually managed accounts that might include individual stocks, you can probably do it. And it'll give you an idea of just how much risk you're really taking. How much fluctuation could you expect? And see, that, that's one of the things that makes people successful in markets is they come into the market with realistic expectations. You've got to have realistic expectations. Uh, many people enter the market without, you know, without knowing or they saw expectations. They saw a fund that went up a lot over the past couple of years and then they project that into, out into the future without knowing anything else. That is a really rough way to invest because the market is a, a brutal teacher. Um, by the way, that's, that's called chasing performance. When you see something that's done very well and you look, well, it's got a good three and a five and a 10 year track record. Yeah, well, when it's up a lot in the last year, that will lift your three and five year track record up a lot. So they may not have made anything or they may have been down a lot. In fact, one of the things I always liked about Peter Lynch was how open he was about the stock market performance, picking stocks. This is how open and uh, how honest and matter of fact the guy was. And he talked about the, uh, the Magellan Fund and how he ran that. And uh, it's so funny as I talk to people in their mid-30s now and they're like, who, Peter, what? And I, I guess I shouldn't be laughing because you know, I'm, I'm exposing my age here. The, uh, but uh, anybody my age or older knows who he is and what he did. In fact, Ten thousand dollars in a in the Magellan Fund. It was a mutual fund, and he ran was over three hundred thousand dollars. Thirteen years later, now to my knowledge, he's the only one that's ever done that with a publicly held, publicly or publicly held mutual fund. We'll talk about the rest of that story when we come back from these commercial messages. I can't even speak today. This is Bill Bullington right here on fourteen twenty. Stay tuned. We're back. So, hey, we've been talking a lot about <clears throat> risk and managing the risk. That is so important today. With interest rates as low as they are, you know, you're, most people are going to be forced, literally be forced to invest in the stock market to be able to maintain their lifestyles. And I know they don't want to hear that. And I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you. I don't like people yelling at me either. <laughs> but... I've got news for you. The, um, I wish it weren't that way, but that's the way it is. And it's not like that's a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of stocks. In fact, we're, I'm doing a, uh, I'm working on a little e-course 
a little e-course. It'll be available in a, by summertime because little courses are still hard to make. But anyway, so that you can go in and you can see whether a stock is overpriced or not. Now, let me put a uh, caveat to that. You can see whether or not a, a stock is overpriced or not. It's an estimate. That's what you're doing. You're estimating. I'm going to show you how to estimate, and we're going to even do that at the seminar because it really is not that hard. It really isn't. It isn't that hard to give a, a good estimate of what a stock should normally sell for. Now, when I say that, I'm going to uh, back up a little bit and say it's typically not that hard if you're trying to value a relatively simple business. By that, I mean a business that's in one business and you have to happen to know a little bit about the industry. You don't need to know a tremendous amount. You don't have to be an expert. And if you are, great. You have an edge. But you don't have to, to be a good investor. And you just have to know what, how to uh, basically value a stock. That's one of the reasons I'm not upset about the current stock market, even though it's at all-time highs. Well, you know what? It was at an all-time high in March of 2000, right before it went down 57%. Uh, and it went down again in 2007. It peaked in November, another 50%. It should be at an all-time high. It had a 10-year period where it made nothing. <laughs> and uh, by the way, if you retire and the market does that again, that's not the first time it's ever done that. It won't be the last. You could be back to work when you're in your late 70s or even in your 80s. I mean, think about that for a second. So managing risk is the most important thing, particularly when you're getting ready to take money out of your accounts. Accumulating is one thing. You still want, you want to manage risk all the time, but when you're accumulating and you're adding to it, it's not as difficult. I mean, it's not as difficult for me. I add to my stuff every month, putting money away every month, saving up for retirement. Yeah, and I have a big advantage because I'm adding to it. I'm adding to it. And it, and it's also based on my income. So if I have a, a good year and good income, I get to contribute a whole lot more and, and it's meaningful. Okay. So I have an advantage over somebody who's closer to retirement and is starting to take money out. If you're younger, you have an advantage. Don't blow it. I, people are telling you to put 100% in. They don't know what kind of risk you're taking. You don't need to be 100% invested. I've, actually, the, the optimal level is somewhere between 70-80%. You don't need to have 100% of your money in stocks. That's a bad idea. I, I don't care how old you are. Because if you're adding to it, and uh, even if you're not adding to it, you know you're going to have corrections. 10-15% corrections are like the weather, you know, like the winter. You know it's coming. You just don't know when. Those are normal. Every once in a while, you get a 25% or better. Those are doozy. And occasionally, it'll drop by half. So if you are 100% invested, all you can do is watch. It's very tempting to want to give up at that point. And I, and I appreciate the caller, and I really do, and I'm sorry. The, uh, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I'm, I'm telling you, being 100% invested is not necessary. When a market has a big correction and you just rebound, if you just rebalance your portfolio once a year, you would be buying stocks if they were down and you would be selling them when they were up just the, through the act of rebalancing. So you're buying lower, selling higher by design without knowing the future. You don't have to know the future that way. So there are lots of little things like that that you can uh, learn at this workshop. And again, it's going to be coming up here. It's the 8th of March, I think. I'm going to, uh, let me double check that because I said that and I hate when I do that. Yeah, I think it's, it, I'm pretty sure it's March 8th. If you have any questions on any of this stuff that you hear me talking about, uh, feel free to reach out. You can email me, bill at bullingtoncapital.com. You can actually call us 330-664-0700. Go to the website, bullingtoncapital.com. All of our contact information is all over the website there. You can sign up for that seminar there. Uh, it's at Tracy's corporate college and this one, you know, we're going to focus on estimating the impact of a financial crisis, trying to estimate how much risk we're actually taking in our portfolios. A lot of people are taking, I'd laugh all the time when I think about, uh, some of the, uh, my good clients over the years, when they first came to me, the, uh, they had, <laughs> they were saying how conservative they were. And I'm looking at the stocks in the funds that they hold and going, wow, <laughs> 
So your idea of being conservative is having 10% position in Cisco Systems? <laughs> they didn't know. They didn't know. And to be fair, the tools were nowhere near as good as they are today. And the ones that did have access to the tools, you know, you're, you're paying a lot of money for that. I know because I did. And the average person, the average investor, the average broker wouldn't pay for that. I mean, the average brokerage firm didn't pay a lot for that. The, uh, you had to do things. That, there, it was so much more manual. It was, that was brutal, actually. I look back now and I go, how did I ever have the energy <laughs> to go through and look at all that stuff? And I can tell you, it's not just energy; it's, it's knowledge. Part of what we're going, we'll talk about at the workshop is the uh, how do you how do you estimate what a company should actually be selling for, and why is that important, and why is it important? Everybody should know how to do this because it's not hard. I'm going to go through step by step. I have a little handout. You can take it home. You can look at other stocks. Look look stocks up. Okay. Yeah, there are no secrets. There haven't been any secrets about the stock market for a hundred years. The, uh, they're just information that hasn't been circulated uh, as well as some others. And, you know, my industry loves to make things complicated. I think their, their motto is, why use 10 words when a thousand are so much more eloquent? <laughs> I, really believe, I really believe that. There are people that just, they just thrive on making things incredibly complicated. And then you have people like me out there. I'm like, I'm from the Occam Razor School. The simplest solution is often the best. And it's just don't make it any more complicated than it as is absolutely necessary. So you're looking at companies. Looking at companies. How can you estimate what they should be selling for? It's relatively simple to do. And uh, I've been trying to been talk, talk about this for a long time, but I'm telling you, it's not as hard as you think it is. What is hard is people don't like to stay away. They want certainty. You can't have certainty. What you want to do is you want to identify the easier ones. Okay? That's what you want to be able to do. Is identify the easier ones where you have an edge. Or at least you feel like you have an edge. The, uh, um, the market will tell you whether you have an edge or not after you've purchased the stock. And you can see how well things went for you. And that could take time, by the way. Another thing that uh, a lot of people are kind of impatient about. Uh, there's some things you can do to speed that process up too, incidentally. But um, figuring out what a company should be selling for and then trying to buy it for less than that, not too hard. I'm telling you. You only need to know a handful of items. And by the way, one of the reasons that Value Line used to be so popular was they were one of the companies that purchased or published that information on about 1,500 companies at the time. I don't know how many they cover now. But the, uh, I remember they always covered right around 1,500 people, and they gave a really good analysis. I really liked that service. So th that was available at your library for free. I'm sure everybody had a ton of time to run down the library and look up their stuff. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, but the Standard Poor's, they had these things. We called them tear sheets, I think. Standard Poor reports on all the companies had all the information that you, uh, the, at least the financial information that you needed. And if you knew how to apply some stuff, yeah, you could do very well. Over time, very well. By the way, is the uh, depends on who's describing it, because what's very well for some people is very poorly for others, and vice versa. I think I, I've got about two minutes left on the show here. I meant to look up the uh, current interest rates. Uh, the ten-year yield is two point eight six. So uh, when that yield gets up to about three point seven five, your short-term rates should be somewhere around two point seven to. 3 and uh at that point in time I think the uh that's probably at least the research that I've seen uh that's probably where rates tend to peak out so they're probably going to go up another couple times this year uh if the Fed does what they are saying that they might do and that can change at any minute by the way via because something can happen in the meantime but at that level okay and I think stocks are extremely fairly priced Especially if you're not plowing all your money into the stuff that's just gone up the most. If you've got, if you've been really happy with your mutual fund performance over the past four to five years, you need to start looking now. I'm here to tell you there's risk there that you don't see. You get to the seminar, I'll show you where it is and how to identify it. 
So i got about 60 seconds left. You'd like to contact me, just go to my website, BullingtonCapital.com. There's a contact us form there. You can sign up for that seminar. You can get my phone number, give us a call, and uh, feel, feel free because we'll be glad to take a look at your portfolio for you, tell you, how, tell you how much risk you're taking, show you what we do, how we plan on mitigating that risk, how we plan on handling that risk. Now they hear the music, that means the show is definitely over. Thanks again for listening, everybody. I'm Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon on 1420 The Answer. Have a good weekend. Good investing and good luck.